just wait till we start talking about the Solomon Islands. We should probably do that before we run out of time. But, well, because I think the Solomon Islands are an example of like how bad things can get. And and I want to hear from you where you think things are right now. Uh, we should probably give a little bit of background. How do, how do we want to, how best well, we want to do that? Do we want to start from the election that just happened? Last? Uh, or would, do we need I would background? Start, I would start from, from 2019 when at that time the, the prime minister, Manasseh Sogavari, did what they call the switch, which is switching diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to the PRC. And he'd already been prime minister, I think, for a couple of years. Uh, at the uh, time, but he, uh, he was he had been prime minister before, uh, but he was elected again in 2019. OK, and then he and then he did the switch. And then that's when like everything started to change. Well, already by Solomon that point, Islands. there were like as Cleo has mentioned on the show, uh, lots of Chinese influence operations, uh, e economic activity in the country, money being placed in the hands of politician very similar to what it sounds like the previous governor of mariana islands might have been kind of in, yeah. kind of been doing well it's a, it's a snowball effect right like the, the ccp had to build up all those things for then them to make the switch which then itself triggered even more of the chinese influence right uh yes sorry just um legal disclaimer uh, unproven allegations against the previous governor of cnmi in spite of ongoing investigations by a special prosecutor <clears throat> and uh, he's a reptile. <clears throat> yes, and uh, and this may give you uh, headaches, nausea, um, incontinence, whatever. I'm giving the, the entire disclaimer around the. Uh, mm. uh, That's the disclaimer of every episode of our show. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the wait, point... wait, no, she she has more to say here, right? Okay. Yeah, yes, I am. I am. Uh, I am going check to uh, what Matt just said about um, about Solomon's. Yes. So, but and and the and this. That's why you, the, the, the Solomon's case is heartbreaking, uh, but also really worth taking a close look at because unusually we have the start date of, of 2019 where there was a switch. So it gives you a sense of what China, they, they had obviously been on the ground very effect effectively beforehand in order to get the switch to happen. But you've got this start point from which you can see what happens when China can just goes full bore into a country. And by the way, one of the ways that they uh, happened to be able to do the switch was through this kind of subnational um, uh, building up of a local. Um, Did we say the switch was going from recognizing Taiwan to recognizing mainland China? In case right. we didn't say that. Yes, we yeah, did. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I know, I know you were out for a little while and just came back into the room and um, <laughs> missed that. Hey, just, at least mentally, he was out <laughs> for a little while. I, and then I, just I, he was thinking about room. reptiles. I was. Oh, and Rome. <laughs> Rome. I wonder if the reptiles were active back then as well. Yeah. I mean, there were politicians <laughs> in Rome. That's true. I'll go on the internet. I'm sure there's <laughs> lots of fun websites I can go we, to. We have a guest, Chris. <laughs> okay. Uh, Cleo, go ahead. I'm going to look up uh, reptilians <laughs> in ancient Rome. Okay. Do you want me to wait? No, 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 please just go ahead. <laughs> uh, so they they went in through, and the point of this is that they developed a strong relationship with the guy that runs Guadalcanal. Now, this is again, we're we're back to our World War II history, right? So Solomon Islands is the site of the battle of the Guadalcanal. The capital is on the island of Guadalcanal. This is where Iron Bottom Sound is where Bloody Ridge is. I mean, these are a lot of Americans died. Um, I mean, others as well. Uh, the Coast Watchers, the the local Solomon Islanders, saved uh, countless lives, and in fact, may have changed the whole course of the war. Um, so, you know, th this is a this is a place like Saipan where um, you don't want to. You don't want to take it lightly be because um, the the amount of blood that soaked into those beaches the last time you had an expansionist Asian power run through the through the area um, is was horrific. And you've had uh, Professor uh, Toshiyoshi Hara on, and he's he, he wrote an excellent monograph 
uh, about how the PLA has studied in depth the, the war in the Pacific, um, learning both from the Japanese and from the American sides about what's important, where to place, what the weaknesses are. And his one of his findings is that he, he thinks that it's very possible that the PLA thinks that the American Navy looks a lot like the Japanese Navy in World War II, which is it's large, but it's brittle. So the, these we keep hearkening back to the war, first of all, because um, so many Americans died. And um, um, f- for, for reasons that resonate still today, um, in terms of freedom and, and openness and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, also because the strategic importance hasn't changed and the PLA has looked at it very carefully. And after 2019, one of the first places that Chinese linked companies tried to get a hold of physically lease was Tulagi, which was the first place that the Japanese hit, uh, when they came into the Solomons and it was, that was because that was where the British had set up their headquarters. The geography hasn't changed, right? So if you if you go back to that period, you can see these patterns developing. And what China, I would argue, is trying to do is set itself up through political warfare in the same way that the, uh, the Japanese set themselves up through uh, kinetic warfare in a place like Solomon's, although in a place like Saipan, of course, they already had control over it. Um, because of the the League of Nations. Um, so what happened is they cultivated these subnational uh, groups, uh, and uh, it was it was Gua- the governor of Guadalcanal, and then he came into the central government when Sogavari was elected in 2019, and you had this switch, and not everybody was delighted with the switch and. Uh, good friend of the show, uh, and the show has been a very good friend to him, uh, Daniel Suidani was at that moment the premier of the most populous province in the Solomons, Malaita province. And he and his government and the traditional chiefs of Malaita issued the Auki communique. Auki is the capital of Malaita, A-U-K-I, which is one of the most courageous documents I've seen in this political warfare battle against the Chinese Communist Party. And it says that they want to put a moratorium on any new Chinese-linked companies operating in the province. And they give a whole list of regions, reasons, including they uh, don't want to live in a police state and that they believe in freedom of religion uh, as opposed to the Chinese Communist Party. Party, which is a systemically atheist system. Um, it's a it's a document of just simple clarity about why you don't want to let the Chinese Communist Party come into your jurisdiction and run your economy and through your economy affect your society and your politics. That marked him out as uh, enemy number one in the Solomon Islands. And when he needed medical care, not long after that, he had some health issues and he needed an MRI and there's no MRI in the country. And under normal circumstances, the central government would uh, help pay for this, uh, for the medical treatment outside the country if you're the premier of a province. And they said effectively, not officially, but through intermediaries, if you let the Chinese come in, we'll give you the money for the treatment. And he said, no. So this is a man who has shown he would literally rather die than take Chinese money and compromise the future of his people. Um, The Australians said, uh, and what the Australians say is relevant because strategically in this area, the U.S. has delegated a lot of the leadership to Australia, said, Sure, you can come to Australia for medical care, but you're going to have to raise like $100,000 to put up in advance. And this is an honest politician whose monthly salary is about $800. Uh, so he didn't have the money for, for that. 
What ended up happening was, and this is a really, this is a free and open Indo-Pacific story. An Indian professor who you've had on the show, Professor Nalapat, ended up hearing about it. And he knows President Tsai, who is then president of Taiwan, and got in touch with her office directly. And she personally intervened to enable him to come to Taiwan for the medical treatment that he needed. But while he was away, the uh, Chinese and the Chinese proxies started spreading money around Malaita to try to buy up enough of the members of the provincial legislature to get him out as premier. Condensing a lot of history here, but they um, on the third attempt, he came back to the country and on the third attempt, they, it, they got him out. And then not long after that, the uh, central government, the minister for provincial relations, disqualified him even from his elected seat because he wouldn't acknowledge China's definition of a one China policy. So first, Which was absolutely crazy because that was directly the Chinese government pressuring another government to kick out an elected official. Yes. So this is the, the first case I've found, maybe, I mean, you know more than I do, of the of Beijing getting a veto over the voters of another country over who elects them 